Hi, I'm Laura Mandel, and I'm going to discuss how to use digital humanities tools to teach close reading. Uh, we often talk about digital humanities as enabling distant reading. You can read hundreds of thousands of texts at the same time in a computer-assisted way. But actually, digital humanities tools, from my perspective, especially building them and creating them and modeling the data that will go into them, that's what really teaches you about literature, even the literature that originally appeared in manuscripts or printed codex form. Amanda Gailey on Facebook asked people one day how you can teach Scansion, which as many of you know is um, sort of counting out how um, the, the beat of a poem, its meter. And her friend Vanessa uh, answered that, um, you know, there's a tool for better or for worse, which was built by Herbert Tucker. Actually, Herbert Tucker came up with the idea and the Scholars Lab at the University of Virginia built it for him. It's a wonderful tool. You can go to it at prosody.lib.virginia.edu. And um, there are hundreds of poems loaded into this tool. And your students can go there, and you can see all these little icons here uh, on the side here. And one of them is about finding um, accent, and another is about finding feet, and another is about determining the, the kind of meter that we're looking at as a whole. Um, Herbert Tucker got his graduate students to encode the hundreds of poems that go into this tool using what we call TEI. TEI is a set of tags that were developed by humanities scholars, for those of you who don't know, um, who wanted to model texts. Every text put up on the internet is actually a surrogate, and it's more modeled than it is copied. Um, and so the Text Encoding Initiative came up with the tags and the terms that you would need to effectively model texts on a screen, printed texts on a screen, and manuscript as well. So with these um, TEI encoded poems loaded in this tool, what you can do as a student is you can come and you actually click above a, a word or a syllable in order to make it unaccented or accented, and you click between words or syllables in order to divide the, um, the line into feet. And, and then you, um, by hovering over this box here or clicking on it, you get um, a way to say, well, this is one, two, three, four feet of iams, short, long. So this is iambic tetrameter. And I've done all that, and you can see I've got little check marks. So I'm a student, and I've learned how to scan. I've done it correctly. There's a presumption here that I would contest a little bit, and that is that scanning is objective. I've looked at the hundreds of poems that Herbert Tucker's graduate students have encoded for this tool, and you know some of them are better than others, and some of them interpret differently than others. It's not really objective, and a poem like A Slumber Did My Spirit Seal, it pretty much is. But in other poetry, you might really question somebody's scansion. So rather than coming to a tool to find out what's correct or incorrect, we might actually use a tool to look at, at how things have been encoded. Uh, this is my tool called Myopia. Infelitis, felicitously, I must say, uh, it is really not about being narrow-minded, but it's about looking closely. So here I've got a poem loaded into it, and this poem too is TEI encoded using the TEI metrical encoding. And you can see here that um, these bars, these little boxes, longer and shorter, um, show what kind of accent you've got. A big thick box is accented, a little thin box is unaccented, and then the color corresponds to the kinds of feet we're talking about, and you can see the 
the feet are also between lines, just as in Herbert Tucker's tool. This means that a line is enjambed. Here's the scheme that shows you what the colors mean. Um, that, you know, an um, iamb is um, a kind of burnt yellow. If you hover over, so I hovered over uh, thou still, and you'll see it's a spondy. This is a pentameter line, it's got five feet. And that's a spondy, which is long, long. Hover over another one here, and you can see that this is iambic pentameter, short, long. I think I was hovering there. Or anapest pentameter, and that's long, uh, short, short. You can see that we can turn off the words and just look at the metrical scheme very abstractly. We can look at the words alone, and we can look at the coding alone. So this really is a way to address students who need to learn Scansion in the mode that they're most comfortable with. If you're a programmer, this might be more appealing to you. If you're a visual, artistic person, you might prefer the boxes without the words. If you're a, a word person, you might want the words right there. Another feature we added, and we added actually um, tags to the TEI standard set of tags for literary analysis. We added the tags that indicate these boxes, thou, still, unravished those boxes around those words and you can look here and see what they correspond to their literary figures ambiguity uh, all kinds of ways of analyzing the literature um, so if you look back at this you'll see still it's an ambiguous term because of course it could mean yet you're not yet ravished uh, but it could also mean you're still, you stand very still. It's an urn after all. Un, you know, he says unravished instead of thou still virgin bride of quietness. So at, saying something in a negative way is kind of significant, especially it allows him to use a very violent term and um, you would want to look at the connotation of ravished, which implies rape. So this tool helps you look at the tropology uh, associated with it, and it's using poems that we've encoded tropologically using a scheme we added on to the TEI. Here you can see the tropological ode without the meter just by itself. If you hover over a box, it will tell you what the trope is. This is a figure. Its type is metaphor and its tenor is urn. In other words, a child is being, the, the child is being used as a metaphor for the urn that Keats is talking to and about. If I hover over this, um, it's a kind of agency that's problematized in the poem. And um, the type here is anthropomorphism, right? The urn is being treated as if it were a person expressing something and the agent is um, the urn. The urn is the one who expresses. You can pull back and just look at the literary figures scattered throughout the poem and um, zoom in then later on areas you're interested in. You could compare poems either tropologically or as here we're comparing metrical schemes by pulling back. You can turn off all the visuals, accept the stress, and look at the stressed and unstressed syllables, and even turn off the unstressed and just look at the stressed and perhaps even just try to read the stressed syllables to see what happens. The most interesting thing from my perspective is um, the TEI encoding that is done on the poems before they're loaded into the tool. Here you can see the meter scheme, and here's an instance of meter being in, the meter being encoded. You can see that 
it's supposed to be, the TEI allows you to say, well, this is supposed to be an I am, but what it really is is a spondy thou still instead of thou still. Um, and people might disagree with me on that. They might say it's, well, it's not. It's a, tr it's a trochee. It's um, long, short. We also encoded for sounds, and that's not yet pictured in the tool, but we hope to picture it or to render it orally. Um, but we developed a coding scheme to add on to the TEI for the kinds of sounds that one finds in poetry as delineated by literary critics here. I'm using Susan Wilson's um, list. Alliteration, assonance, consonance, and rhyme. And then you can see the TEI encoding of what we call the sound ode. Um, thou still unravished. It's a consonance, assonance, quai, bride, rhymes with quai. And when we visualize those or make them available via sound that can be played while you're looking, or both, um, the coding scheme is here ready to use. Also, when you analyze poetry, you might want to know whether uh, a sentence is in interrogative mode or imperative mode. In fact, Susan Wolfson has a whole book about interrogatives in poetry. It makes a difference um, about whether you're being told something, commanded, or questioned. And so here you can see um, the kinds of sentences or sentence parts, what mode they're in, and various other aspects of syntax. Uh, what are the objects that appear in poems? What are the subjects? One can code many poems and then begin to ask what those kinds of questions, either using the visualization tool Myopia or using other digital humanities tools and even creating your own tools. Then, of course, here's the tropology, literary elements. So one is figure, lip figure. And um, he's, these are the available types. This is, again, all coding scheme that was added on to the TEI. And here you can see it encoded. It's a TEI document, um, but then it has these literary figures added on. Apostrophe, thou. Keats is talking to that urn, apostrophizing it. Um, and um, you can see when I hovered over child, that literary figure metaphor came up and said the child is a metaphor for the urn. The tools available here as well as some videos about how to use it, but I actually find in teaching with digital humanities that giving students a finished tool is often not as effective as getting them to help build it. So I put on the TEI site, there's a tool wiki site, my poetry visualization tool, and where you can get all of the documents that you need um, to code using the schemes that I have invented for tropology, syntax, sound, and then of course the meter um, is already a, recognized by the TEI and already part of it. I find that allowing students to encode in this way um, actually makes them learn so much more about literature than just presenting the finished thing to them. If you say to a student, go through and find all the literary figures and tag them in Ode on a Grecian Urn, they're going to learn a lot about literary figure. And if the, the fruit of their work is then going to be visible in the poetry visualization tool, they're going to feel pretty excited about what they were able to do. And they can share it with others and explain why they made their decisions, why they decided to call that a metaphor as opposed to a metonymy. They, it's, it's a bit like gamers who really much more enjoy modding games than they do playing them. And I think that that's where we'll really catch our students, is in getting them to help us model documents and interpret them through that modeling. So that's how I teach um, and use digital humanities to teach something important 
about close reading, about poetry, and about literature. Thank you. Hello, I'm Liz Grumbach, and I work as the project manager for ARC, the Advanced Research Consortium, and 18th Connect, one of ARC's research nodes, which can be found at 18thConnect.org. Both ARC and 18th Connect are housed at Texas A&M's Initiative for Digital Humanities, Media, and Culture, or IDHMC, or as some people like to say, IDMIC. Today I'll be speaking a bit about the evolution of ARC and its research nodes, but first I'd like to begin with a quote from Jerome McGann's essay on creating a usable future in the 2011 edition of Profession. If there is a crisis in the humanities, as many seem to think, it is only partly about processes of tenure and promotion and ways of evaluating new forms of scholarship. The more central problem is the sustainability of born digital resources and the work that they support. The imperative to establish online scholarship, both its research and its publication, as a general institutional practice. McGann, in this essay, refers to the DPLA, or the Digital Public Library of America, as a case study, but he also talks about another project he designed, NINES, or Networked Infrastructure for 19th Century Electronic Scholarship, or NINES.org. Growing out of a need for a central publication space online, NINES was created to solve the problem of accessibility and sustainability of early scholarly digital projects. The usual means of publication and promotion for these archives were not possible, and so NINES was created in order to sustain pathways to this knowledge. NINES is an aggregator, an experiment in creating informational design for scholarly work on a global scale. But I'm going to take a step back now and introduce you to the other research nodes that exist. Modeled after NINES, there's 18th Connect, 18th Century Scholarship Online, the only other live site as of now, MESA, Medieval Electronic Scholarly Alliance, which is going live late this year, Reckon, the Renaissance English Knowledge Base, which is currently seeking funding, and ModNets, or Modernist Networks, which just received an NEH grant to discuss metadata schemas for modernist projects they hope to ingest. The software that runs behind all of these sites is called Colex, a collections and exhibits builder. This is a Ruby on Rails application that runs by way of a solar indexer, or a large catalog that contains specific types of metadata, RDF, for all collected objects in all accepted or peer-reviewed projects. Regrettably, I don't have more time to discuss RDF, our processes of peer review and other node business, specifically tool development, as I want to turn now towards ARC. If anyone is interested in the Colex design and software capabilities, how the nodes run on the semantic web using our standardized metadata format, or our rigorous peer review process, I'd love to answer questions, and my contact information can be found at the very beginning and the very end of this presentation. ARC was born shortly after 18th Connect was launched. We provide an organizational policy and a set of metadata standards for interactive and collaborative digital research nodes, which I just spoke about. So the ARC offices have the following tasks. One, to maintain interoperability between nodes. When the RDF standards, peer review standards, or director positions are up for review, ARC handles all communication between nodes. This includes when new nodes come online. ARC is also in place to ensure that our nodes are not reinventing the wheel. By working together, by collaborating, and by ARC's coordination efforts, we share and collaborate instead of producing tools alone in our offices, in our institutions. Two, to maintain sustainability of nodes. ARC provides programming and monetary support for development and revision of software, metadata standards, and peer review. While the nodes are encouraged to seek outside financial aid to sustain their individual node business, ARC provides coordination 
and support on this point. Three, contract negotiation with proprietary databases. ARC communicates and negotiates with proprietary scholarly databases like JSTOR, Gale, ProQuest, and Project News in order to receive metadata and more. These objects, while not made directly accessible through the nodes because of the database paywalls, are nonetheless made available via search through the nodes. Therefore, a search for a specific subject in 18th Connect, Nines, Mesa, or a federated search within all of these nodes will return hits from a full text search of Gale, ProQuest, Project News, and JSTOR. Most importantly is point number four, ARC houses and runs the ARC catalog. The public version of this catalog can be found online and you can see that address on the screen here. It contains all metadata indexed by our nodes that is open access or tagged as free culture. However, the private version of this catalog, that which contains proprietary metadata that Gale and ProQuest will not give you, or will not often give you, is soon to be housed on our service, servers at Texas A&M, a feat that no other university besides A&M was able to accomplish. It is this catalog, both the public and private versions of it, that are the future of ARC, and they possibly create a model for the future of the humanities. As more open access or free culture digital projects are added to our catalog, our data sets grow. In the public version of the catalog, this means that the public, public scholars, graduate students, and academics can access this data through our API or web service and play with it. And play is the most important part of humanities scholarship. In addition, as evidenced by our contracts with proprietary databases, the doors of access are opening. They are moving at a very glacial pace, but they are moving, and ARC has a direct line of communication with these organizations. We are preparing for the future of humanities scholarship. I'd like to end by considering where the user fits into the ARC network. I do this because as the project manager of a node and as project manager of ARC, I've been approached multiple times by individuals that want to be involved. One of our issues and something that we have been criticized for in the past is our lack of attention to the public and to create a truly usable future and a truly working infrastructure for the humanities. ARC cannot rely on its peer review structure and metadata standards alone. So when users wish to do more than what fits into the services we offer, we listen to their needs and wants and we respond. In some cases, we are able to write the interested party into a grant or help them to write a grant based on our data, like our early modern OCR project or EMOP. More information about EMOP can be found at emop, e -M -O -P, dot tamu, t -A -M -U, dot edu. In other cases, we are able to work closely with the individual scholar. For example, we were recently contacted by a scholar in Dublin that wanted to make 150 20-page sermons found in the ECHO database searchable for his dissertation project. Because the texts from ECHO were riddled with OCR errors, he emailed 18th Connect for advice. Because 18th Connect has developed a tool called Typewrite that houses full text from ECHO and allows users to edit out the OCR errors, we were able to offer him the means to clean up these sermons for his project. And because of Ark's relationship with Gale, once he corrected these texts, he was given his corrected text in plain text format and an XML output of the corrected text from our offices. In some cases, of course, these venues do not work. However, we are still in and will hopefully always be in active development and every interested user is a challenge accepted. ARC will continue to evolve with the needs of the scholarly community. Soon ARC will develop other ways of involving the public, but this is of course dependent upon the cooperation and support of our university systems and traditional scholars. The future of this network, the future of the humanities network, this space of collaboration, sustainability, and access depends on administrators, traditional scholars, and departments recognizing the importance of a network that looks toward the future of our field. 
Once again, my name is Liz Grumbach. I am the project manager of ARC and 18th Connect. My contact information can be found on the bottom right portion of this screen, and it was a pleasure. Hi, I'm Laura Perings. I'm a doctoral student in English here at Texas A&M University. I'm working with the Initiative for Digital Humanities, Media, and Culture, uh, otherwise known as the IDHMC. And I'll just be giving a quick talk today to introduce a project that we've begun working on that we believe feel, um, serves as a good example of the interdisciplinary and collaborative benefits of digital culture. Digital culture is blossoming today, driven by collaborative efforts between experts who can bridge the gaps between academic specialties. These projects recreate a cohesive whole for topics that have been divided by scholastic fields. Complete knowledge of a given poem, for instance, requires studying all printings and iterations of the text, including the musical settings and the role these various incarnations played in the reception of and familiarity with the poems. Growing interest in the intersection of music and poetry prompted the Initiative for Digital Humanities, Media, and Culture at Texas A&M University to collaborate with Dr. Paula Feldman, Professor of English at the University of South Carolina, along with their Center for Digital Humanities under the direction of David Miller, to embark on a new digital archive endeavor that provides access to musical settings of romantic poetry. The project, called Performing Romantic Lyrics, will include images of the scores accompanied by sound recordings and seeks, among other things, to map the transmission of romantic poetry, especially by female authors, in musical form. The archive uses the standards of the Music Encoding Initiative, or MEI, to mark up the scores and record metadata regarding publication, performance, and other details of transmission. The research goals of this project strongly exemplify the interdisciplinary benefits that make MEI a vital part of conducting literary studies. Dr. Paula Feldman's research on the poetess tradition motivated the use of digital tools to further our understanding of the transmission of musical settings and the significance of this method of dispersal for the popularity of certain writers, particularly in the Romantic era. Feldman has uh, observed that works in the poetess tradition were frequently set to music and argues that it was in this musical form that the poetry became popularly known. Domestic performances of these songs meant that people were perhaps more familiar with the musical settings of the poems initially, rather than the original form. In particular, these musical settings were reprinted in the United States, and in that form, the works of the authors such as Felicia Hemans became recognizable and spread across the country. The use of MEI standards and the related tools being developed are imperative to an expanding knowledge and research not just in music, but also in literary studies. By combining MEI with visualization tools, sound recordings, and TEI, this project highlights relationships between the poem, the musical setting, and the musical performance that have hitherto gone unexplored. Or at least, they've not been explored so easily. In addition, PRL will make information about these musical settings available in one place to ease the research of other scholars of music and poetry. Currently in its beginning stages, its very beginning stages, this project will provide texts of romantic poetry marked in TEI and images of musical settings of romantic poetry, beginning with works by Felicia Hemans and Lord Byron as two well-known and prolific examples. Accompanying these images are sound files of the performances in order to make connections between the sound and the musical notation more accessible to those who are not adept at reading music, as I know many literary scholars are not. This site plans to implement the Augmented Notes tool developed by Joanna Swafford, a doctoral candidate in English at the University of Virginia, when it is released. Augmented Notes connects the sound file to the image of the sheet music and visually marks which measure is being played, a process that relies in part on an MEI file. These aspects of the project, the scans, the sound files, and the augmented notes project, are designed to increase the ability or the accessibility of the music. In addition, each song will eventually be marked with MEI, beginning with the headers and eventually filling in the archive with markup of the musical notation itself, uh, which is where I come in. I received training in MEI at the MEI summer camp held at the University of Virginia last summer, <clears throat> run by Dr. Perry Rowland, who developed the markup language and his colle colleagues from the University of Paderborn, Germany, namely Johannes Kepper and Maya Hartwig, sorry if I've 
messed up the name pronunciation. Um, this is an opportunity to, I highly recommend to anyone interested in musicology and digital humanities. The MEI markup language is a set of XML standards similar to, but not related to, TEI. Most of the work I've just described will be managed by the team at USC under the direction of Dr. Feldman, while at Texas A&M we will be undertaking the application of MEI as well as other assorted tasks. Drs. Laura Mandel and Maura Ives, Director and Assistant Director respectively of the IDHMC, serve as the PIs for our portion of the project. While we do intend to mark up the notation of the individual scores as a whole eventually, uh, we are presently combining ourselves to the creation of MEI headers for each of the scores that we can build um, so that we can build a skeletal framework for the archive. In part, this is due to limited time and workforce since marking up the whole score is a time-consuming process and, well, there's just me working on it right now, but the decision is also a result of our current research goals. As we begin the project, we are most interested in the metadata of these settings. Our first task is to record publication and performance data. As we accrue more music, it will be possible to take this information in the headers and develop visualizations to, of the transmission process for individual songs, as well as for large quantities of settings with specifications of year, composer, publisher, poet, region, etc. In addition, the markup will eventually allow us to find alterations to the music across a wider selection of additions with greater ease. These visualizations will assist our research into the alterations that occurred during the transmediation from poetry to music. Such alterations include metrical changes, change in speaker or singer voice, gen, uh, the voice gender, that is, um, changes in tone, alterations to words, etc. Alongside these visualization efforts for the music, the project will make use of the currently in development uh, Myopia Visualization Tool for Poetry. This tool, developed at Miami University of Ohio by Laura Mandel and a team um, in, consisting of, and I'm going to ruin your name and I apologize, Manish Chaturvedi, uh, Gerald Gennad, Helen Armstrong, and Eric Hodgson, I believe. Visuali uh, and this tool visualizes poetic elements and is presently used in conjunction with the Poetess Archive, created by Dr. Laura Mandel and housed currently at Texas A&M. Myopia will allow us to compare the structure and the use of elements in poetic texts, as well as in the musical lyrics, and visually clarifies the relationship between these um, additions and alterations. In addition, the Poetess Archive will include a link to the PRL site for texts found in both archives, thereby providing a link between the poetical text and the musical settings and connecting two digital projects without combining them, allow re allowing researchers to navigate between both or use each discreetly. The MEI standards for recording metadata and the ability to mark minute details in the music we hope will enable visualizations of a greater range of information pertinent to the study of poetry set to music and in the transmission of poetry across countries that has hitherto been unavailable or attempted. Uh, once the data is accrued, it will be beneficial for our digital humanities centers to develop tools that will allow us to interact with the data in new ways and to use other MEI-based tools as they are developed and released. As a result, literary scholarship can approach primary sources in a new way and discover new, more difficult questions to ask about the relationship between music and poetry. Because after all, isn't that where digital humanities is at its best? In addition to performing romantic lyrics, there are several other wonderful projects working on digital tre um, treatments of music and poetry. And I hope that these projects will inspire much research and a deeper understanding of musicology and literary studies, as well as of the potential of interdisciplinary digital humanities. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matthew Christie, and I'm the lead software applications developer at the Initiative for Digital Humanities, Media, and Culture here at Texas A&M University. I'd like to spend just a little bit of time going over the uh, EMA project that's currently underway here at the IDHMC by looking at the processes and workflows that we've developed so far for the project. So EMOP stands for Early Modern OCR Project, and it's a Mellon Grant funded project to uh, provide full text or improve currently available full text for the entire corpus of digitally available English language documents from the 15th through 18th centuries. So what we're talking about are the page images that make up the uh, early English books online collection and the 18th century collections online, Ebo and Echo. 
We're going to be doing this by utilizing uh, open source tools and crowdsourcing uh, informed through book history to tell us sort of how to go on the project. So our partners on the project uh, include IMPACT, which stands for Improving Access to Text. It's a European group that did uh, a similar project that finished up not too long ago, and they are serving for us as advisors. Uh, Clemens Newdecker in particular has um, been very helpful. Uh, the difference between the IMPACT project and what we are doing is that um, IMPACT used uh, Abbey Fine Reader as their OCR engine, which is a commercial OCR engine. We are using um, OCR engines that are open source and available for free. We're also working with Prima Research. It's a research group at the University of Salford in England. Um, they have developed a tool called Alethea that um, is a document layout system. And they've been working with us to um, help us uh, with improved functionality in Alethea. And they're developing an, uh, an Alethea web tool that we can use in later stages of the project. We're working with Performance Software, which is a commercial software company who were involved with the development of the Juxta tool, currently available through Nines, and the Typewrite tool available through 18th Connect. We're also working with um, Gale Sengage Learning, who's providing access to uh, the Echo Catalog, and ProQuest, who's providing access to the Evo Catalog, and then um, the TCP, the Text Creation Partnership, who is providing us with um, all of the uh, hand-keyed transcriptions that they've done so far for uh, Evo and Equid documents. We're working with um, CSER, which stands for the Software Environment for the Advancement of Scholarly Research through the University of Illinois. They are providing um, post-processing tools to help us um, kind of improve the results that we get from our OCR, working with R. Mannatha from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, who is uh, providing us with an algorithm to help us determine the uh, effectiveness of the OCR that we're doing. Ted Underwood, also from the University of Illinois, has provided us with a period-specific dictionary that we can use to uh, help us correct our results, and um, Texas A&M University Libraries. So the process in a nutshell is um, relatively simple seeming. First, we collect all the data, meaning all the documents that we have. Um, we have uh, someone who's doing research on fonts and printers for the documents that will help us identify uh, which fonts we should train our OC engine, OCR engine on um, in order to scan documents that use those specific fonts, hopefully to improve our results. Um, we, uh, once we get um, OCR results, then we can uh, evaluate those results. First, we do some post-processing to uh, hopefully uh, improve results by doing dictionary lookups and using n-grams and those kinds of analyses. And then we have some uh, algorithms that will look at our results and determine whether they are good enough. Uh, and if not, then hopefully um, what the problem was so that we can then um, discover more uh, about the problems that exist in the Evo and Echo catalog as far as OCR goes. And then crowdsourcing comes in at the end to help us um, correct what can't be OCR or to improve even further the OCR results that we get. So this image is a little blurry, I apologize, but it's, um, it gives a much more detailed um, look at our workflow. Uh, so documents are collected and the metadata is put into a database. And then book history methods are applied to the data in order to identify possible or probable fonts for each doc. Then each document is um, OCR'd on an engine that's been trained in that specific font, um, in, in the specific font which has been identified for each document, um, in batches, of course. Uh, the results are analyzed and corrected as much as possible, and then 
those that are determined to be not good enough are sent to a triage step where we determine what to do next depending on our results. So uh, we could end up sending them to be regosiard on a different font. If um, the font just doesn't work and can't be identified, then it can be sent to our Cobra tool, which is developed by the Texas a and University Libraries um, for font identification. Um, if the document can't be OCR at all, then it can be sent to Cobra for um, scholars to do uh, manual keying of the text. Um, if the problem is that we are not getting good line segmentation from our OCR engine, then we will send it to Alethea Web, which is the tool that uh, Prima Research is developing for us. That will help us improve our line segmentation to help us hopefully get improved OCR results. And um, if the problem with bad OCR results is that there's just too much noise, then we can send it through a pipeline to process and clean up the images, hopefully good enough to OCR them again. <clears throat> and then for results that we get that are pretty good, then those end up going to uh, our current typewrite tool where they would be available for people to do uh, crowdsource manual corrections. So the first step is collecting the data, which ended up being a much bigger and more difficult task than we initially uh, imagined. And the problem is that we're talking about 307,000 total documents from different sources, which equates to 45 million page images. So from EBO, we're getting 125,000 documents that, uh, comp uh, that comprise um, 15th through 17th century. And then from ECHO, we're getting 182,000 documents uh, from the 18th century. Those will all be in the form of page images. From ECHO, we're also getting 180,000 um, XML files, which constitute the uh, results of the OCRing process that they have already done. Um, but the results were not that great. It varies from document to document, but by and large, they weren't very good. EBO tried the same thing, um, but the results were so bad that they were never released. So essentially, we have zero. Uh, OCR documents from EVO. And then from the TCP, we're getting um, over 47,000 double keyed transcriptions um, from EVO and ECHO. Most of that being in the EVO catalog because since um, that collection has never been OCR, they concentrated on those. So concurrently with that is um, font research. So um, our postdoc, Jake Heil, is leading an effort to identify the printers that are used for as many of these documents that we have as possible. So he's going to create a catalog of early modern printers by um, harvesting metadata from uh, all the metadata that we've collected for the EVO and ECHO documents, uh, primarily the imprint lines. And then identify the fonts that were likely used for each document based on the printer and data available. So for each document, he's going to try and collect um, printer or publisher names, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the date of the printing, the place or locale. So place would be something like London, whereas locale would be, you know, uh, by the sign of the rose and the unicorn or something. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then um, once all that data has been collected into a database of, uh, of printer information, then we can use it to try to identify which font was used for each document, and then also for, say, documents where we don't have a printer or a publisher name, um, it's possible that we might be able, once we have all that database and we can start playing with it, all that data in the database, we can start looking for other correlations, like if a document was printed in a certain locale and date, then it's um, possible that it was printed by a particular printer that we know matches that same information. 
So all of this is going to be going into a database of book history, which will help us not only identify the fonts to use when OCR in each document, but should be a valuable resource in its own right. Also concurrently with that, um, Kathy Tarabi, a graduate candidate, or a doctoral candidate here, is working with a team of undergrads to create training data for each of the fonts that we identify that need to be trained on. So Alethea will um, let them block off grid, uh, glyphs in, the, in a document and identify the Unicode character values. And then we can use that to create training data that can be used in multiple open source OCR engines. Right now we're looking at Tesseract and Gamera and uh, OCR Opus is another option that we might use. So once we have all that training data um, built up from Aletheia, then we need to get it into our OCR engine. So right now we're looking at Tesseract and uh, Brian Tarpley, another um, doctoral candidate here at the IDHMC, has developed a tool that he's calling Franken Plus that lets us create a database of uh, all the letter forms uh, for each character that were trained with Aletheia. So um, the user can look at every A that was identified in Aletheia and quickly determine not only that each letter is actually a capital A or a lowercase b or whatever it is, um, but then pick one or more really good representative samples um, for that letter form. And then once that's done for each letter form, then we can use any text document to create uh, a training document that can be run through Tesseract to train it to recognize documents with that font. So basically this tool allows us to create, uh, to use any font trained in Aletheia to create uh, training in Tesseract. Once that's done, then of course um, each document that's identified as using that font will be OCR'd and we'll get a series of results. And the first thing that we need to do is um, determine whether those results are good. So for those documents where we have um, TCP ground truth or original OCR, so the ECHO catalog, we have several different algorithms and tools that we can use to determine whether um, the results that we're getting are improved over what we already had. Um, uh, so the Juxta tool that was developed for um, Nines is one of the tools that's going to be used to do that. Uh, we also have um, a algorithm that was developed by our Matha to uh, tell us whether we've improved on our OCR. And then after that, um, the documents get sent to triage, and of course those where we don't have any previous document to compare against, so the Evo collection, uh, we won't have to worry about trying to do the diffing, we'll just send it to triage, and um, at that step we have a series of algorithms that are being created by Dr. Ricardo Gutierrez Azuna of the Perception Sensing and Instrumentation Lab at the Computer Science Department here at Texas a and University to not only give us an idea of um, how our OCR is doing, but try to determine um, if the results are bad, what the problems might be, so that we can determine the next step to do. And then also, um, we have uh, post-processing steps, so when we do get good results, we still want to run it through um, post-processing to kind of correct any errors that may still be existing. So uh, the Caesar team is developing algorithms using engrams and Levenstein distances and um, using period-specific dictionaries that were provided to us by Ted Underwood, we can hopefully you know, identify any further errors uh, and correct those. So words that um, that 
are getting OCR'd for the most part, but may have a uh, one or two letters missing or incorrect. They those kinds of errors can be corrected through post processing. And then finally, for those documents that, um, due to image quality or uh, whatever problems, uh, just can't be OCR'd at all. Our last attempt is the Cobrate tool, which was developed um, for the Primeros Libros project, um, which includes um, Texas A&M University. And it is a, a comparative book reader and a, using a film strip format. So they're going to be um, altering that slightly so that what we can do is if we have a text that just can't be OCR'd, it can be sent to a queue and then um, scholar can look at that document and look at the rest of the Ebo or, or Echo catalogs and see if there are equivalent documents in those catalogs that have an OCR. And then you use a method to sort of cut and paste the text from those documents in, into the one that can't be OCR to at least get some kind of text result for those documents that uh, Will allow them to be, will allow them to come up in search results in Evo and Echo. And then another um, tool that uh, Cobra is going to provide is um, allowing scholars to look more closely at documents to do further thought identification if it turns out that that step is still necessary. And that's the end of my show, but um, I think. Following me will be uh, several members of the EMOP team who will go over more of these processes in greater detail. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Jacob Heil, postdoc with the IDHMC and project manager for the Early Modern OCR project. Matt Christie, our lead programmer, has told you a bit about the scope and goals of the project to OCR the millions of page images for Early Modern documents archived in 18th century collections online and early English books online, Echo and Evo. Now I want to talk a little bit about one detail of this project, specifically how typography plays a central role in EMOP. I'll begin by talking a little about how exactly typography forms the backbone of this project. And I'll spend much of my short talk discussing some of our processes. Here, I think, we'll be able to see the integral role of book history and bibliography in this big data project. And then I'll conclude by mentioning some of the font-related goals of the near future of the project. EMOP is founded upon principles explored in a Mellon Officer's Grant awarded to Dr. Laura Mandel our director here at the IDHMC and PI on EMA. In this project, Dr. Mandel demonstrated that training OCR engines to read specific typefaces improved the results of their OCR output. So in this example, we can see one of the ways in which this foundational grant project fixed a place where OCR typically has fallen down. Because it had specific defined letter forms to seek out, the OCR engine Gamera could discern the difference between the long S and the F. So expanding the principles here means that we need to know more about uh, which fonts to apply and where. One way we'll do this is by building a font history database that traces the movements of fonts and the spread of type styles into England, Scotland, and Wales. By mapping that information onto metadata found in Ebo and Echo, info like printers, publishers with whom they worked, the dates or date ranges of publications, we will direct our OCR engines to the appropriate font libraries. So as an example, uh, we know that by 1558, the English printer John Day had imported Francois Guillaume's double pica Roman and italic typefaces. So when our automated processes come to a set of page images for which the metadata indicates 1559 and John Day as the printer, 
we steer those page images toward engines that will include Guillaume's Double Pica Roman among the libraries that they use. So this is a brief introduction to the, the ways that uh, typography um, and book history play into EMOP. And I want to describe some of the things that we've done and decisions we've made along the way. And since another hat that I wear as part of the Early Modern OCR project is that of book historian, it's also my job to collaborate with Todd Samuelson, curator of rare books in our special collections library here at A&M. We're building the collaboration specifically um, to build a database um, and to think about uh, through these issues of typography. From the beginning, we had to, to address uh, two primary tasks. One is starting the font history database, and this is the long game. This is how the, uh, how the OCR engines will be, will be running, basically. The other task was that we needed to collect represented typefaces for the Aletheia team to get started on. Kathy Tarabi will tell you about Aletheia in a second. But this was key because while we had to do research, we still had to provide materials for the rest of the team, the, the rest of the project, to get moving. So we started collecting represented, representative typefaces by taking high-resolution TIFF images from pages and books from Cushing's early modern collections. And one of the challenges and early decisions was dealing with the fact that the differences between letter forms are sometimes very minute and difficult to discern. To the careful eye, we can see, for example, the differences in the serifs on the left stem of the M's at the top of the slide here. And because of the findings of the Mellon Officers Grant, just that little half crossbar in the, on the long S, or that's missing from the long S, I should say, because of those findings, we decided to err on the side of specificity. So we can see the, the serifs here that I pointed to, and also the differences in tails and cues. These are some of the defining characteristics of these letter forms. So erring on the side of specificity meant that set of representative font images we collected was potentially unique. So we had to find a way to name the fonts that we were collecting. The bibliographical standard is what we see here. Uh, Guillaume Double Pica Roman. All right. This is named for uh, the punch cutter, in this case, Francois Guillaume, who keeps coming up in my examples, uh, the type size, Double Pica, and the style, Roman. In our case, one of the facts we'd like to discover about these idiosyncratic typefaces, uh, the, the typefaces we're collecting, is who the punch cutter is. But we have to do that through research that we haven't yet done. Also, Double Pica and Roman as classifiers aren't really specific enough to mark the discrete differences for our database. So we had to go with a protocol that was more like this, because it's tied specifically to the things that we know about the fonts extracted based on the books from which they were extracted. So here we have the printer's name, that's first initial of the first name, first three letters of the last name. So this is Miles Flesher, the date of the year of publication, 1633. This is the first printed edition of Dunn's poems, by the way. This is the 20 line height taken from that. This is an average of, of a number of different sections of 20 line heights taken in milli measured in millimeters. And then if we need another classifier, so say uh, Flesher printed two books in 1633 with a 20 line height of 95 millimeters, then we will then go to uh, X height if necessary. And then a further classifier, if we need that, would be total body height, where you measure from the top of an ascender to the bottom of a, des a descender. Another approach to collecting representative typefaces was to think about what exactly we meant by representative. What we wanted was high impact font sets up front so we could train and test them, uh, train and test our OCR processes on the largest possible swaths of texts. So while Cushing was collecting page images, we were also trying to think in terms of probabilities. What fonts, or whose fonts, had the highest likelihood of being statistically relevant? We explored this question in two ways, both of which involved mining the imprint line of our metadata. First, our PhD candidate in the IDHMC, 
uh, Brian Tarpley. He did a, a word frequency analysis, weeding out everything but proper names. Um, and this would ideally, in theory, yield the most prolific printer and publishers of the, of the period. We could get it like a top 10 list in that way. And then I worked to build out associations between printers and publishers so that I could see if there were significant patterns of associations. Both methods, at least in theory, can guide us in font selection by finding the fonts used by those whose products are most commonly represented in the metadata we increase the sample size of our OCR texts so with word frequency it turns out that John Bill shows up a lot in the Evo imprint line and doing a search in Evo shows that we do get about 3,000 hits when searching for the mid 17th century printer, which is statistically significant in the context of the 250 years of printing covered in Evo. And I should say too that we limited these uh, explorations, these kind of statistical explorations to the Evo metadata instead of trying to, to munge the two sources of metadata. We wanted to see if these processes were going to yield any sort of um, meaningful information for us first. So we find when we start digging that John Bill printed everything from a decree protecting fishermen to the Holy Bible. So a variety of texts and a variety of typefaces. But we nonetheless sought out texts printed by John Bill. The network analysis process has to this point been more of a network discovery phase. The visu visualization on the left is a rough parsing of the Ebo imprint line to extract all of the printed by printer X for publisher Y constructions. You'll see that construction in the imprint line sometime. Printed by um, Miles Flesher for John Marriott, for example. In the inset, we can see the node representing Stationer's Company has a great many associations, and this makes good sense. The next question, though, is what these other little clusters represent. How might these be important? What do these other clusters tell us about associations that might yield significant font discoveries for us? Finding the answers to these questions will require more time spent researching and parsing that imprint line. It takes a lot of regular expression trial and error, a lot of named entity tokenizing, to go from something like this roughly tagged imprint line to this, something with clearer associations that give us a higher possibility of successful discovery. So to date, these are the typographical processes with which we've been working. As I've been doing more work alongside the folks training the engines on the fonts of selected, I've learned a little bit uh, that will help us um, shape the way we move forward with regard to typography. For one, we'll focus on typefaces for which we know a bit more. Hendrik Vervliet, for example, has done admirable, painstaking work on tracking the early appearances of Pierre Altin's typefaces. Because of the associations with Shakespeare, we also know a good bit about Francois Guillot's typeface. Not least because of the full specimen sheet that survives in the Folger Shakespeare Library in DC. And I've only included a small corner here um, to show some of the detail, but you can see the full sheet um, in the folder, and you can find it online relatively easily as well. So the steps moving forward from here, we're going to continue to work on that, the research, um, building on the shoulders of the giants who have done, um, who have done a lot of the digging into the spread of fonts, a lot of the digging into punch cutters, those sorts of things. We'll focus on those fonts that we know a little bit more about so that we can really hone our processes. And in that regard, we're going to let the technology help with our selection a little bit. Let the ways in which the, the OCR engines want to be trained guide the training that we give them. And so with respect to this, our again, Brian Tarpley, our graduate student here in the, um, here in the IDHMC, has built a tool 
that he's he's continually refining. He's going to tell you a little bit about it in a moment that we've called Franken Plus to help us train uh, Google's OCR engine, which is open source, is why we're using it, um, which is called Tesseract. So Brian will tell you a little bit about that. And then we're also thinking about how we can crowdsource font identification when our automated processes fall down. Um, and Fondue is a tool that we're using for that, or I should say that um, we're thinking about using for that. It's a font discerning utility that I'm building. This is a mock-up of that. To uh, The font discerning utility will work alongside another one of our uh, correction tools, another one of our crowdsourcing correction tools, uh, which will be called Cobra. It will allow a user, um, ideally a, uh, a knowledgeable crowd will come in, um, 18th century scholars, 17th century scholars, book historians, will be able to uh, come in and kind of discern these differences for us and then define those differences in the metadata and then run the poorly OCR'd um, versions because the automated process has fallen down, run, rerun those poorly automated versions so that we can get better results that are defined by the font that we've used. So thanks for your time sitting, sitting through this with me. Um, Kathy Tarabi and Brian Tarpley will talk a little bit more about uh, a couple of other details with the project in a moment. But from, from my part, sorry, uh, for my part, I hope to have demonstrated the roles of typography and book history within the Early Modern OCR project. EMOP is really using book history to answer a technological problem, and we're trying to do this on a large scale. On our most ambitious days, we say that we're trying to solve the OCR problem in early modern page images. So it's a no small feat. And so I've included my, uh, my email at the bottom. Um, you can follow me on Twitter as well. Please feel free to tweet questions or email questions about the presentation. And I thank you very much. Hi, my name is Kathy Chirabi. I'm a graduate assistant researcher with the Initiative for Digital Humanities, Media, and Culture at Texas A&M University. The title of my presentation is Early Modern OCR Project, or EMOP, at Texas A&M University, Training Tesseract with Aletheia Desktop. Scholars are facing a problem. Although the early English books online, or EBO, and 18th century collections online, or ECHO databases, preserve and provide page images and metadata records for early modern and 18th century texts, searching the databases is difficult because current optical character recognition, or OCR engines, struggle to recognize various historic fonts. OCR engines are not trained to read early modern images and are easily confused by irregular baselines, noise, and special characters such as ligatures, italics, and black letter within these fonts. For example, a researcher might have a very difficult time searching for instances of the word greatness in text from 1701 to 1705 within the databases because OCR engines cannot distinguish between the long S special character of the period that has a half crossbar and a modern F with a full crossbar. Here's another example of the differences between long S with a a half crossbar and an F with a full crossbar. Also, uh, here are some examples of uh, other special characters we encountered in these early modern texts. Uh, for example, letters with suspension marks, rotunda R's, and letters with superscripts. The Early Modern OCR Project, or EMOP, at the Initiative for the Digital Humanities, Media, and Culture, or IDHMC, at Texas A&M University, funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, is addressing this problem by training OCR engines to read historic documents in order to make these collections accessible and data mineable. The first step in this project involves using Aletheia Desktop Tool, developed by the Pattern Recognition and Image Analysis Research Lab, or PRIMA, at the University of Salford in Manchester, to create font training libraries for selected early modern and 18th century fonts to train Tesseract, an open source OCR engine developed by Google. Training libraries are created using high-quality TIFF images of fonts from early modern and 18th century texts provided by Texas A&M's Cushing Memorial Library. 10 to 15 images are selected for each font, copied, and saved onto disks as TIFF files. Page images are then assigned to student workers who use Aletheia to hand-correct each page image at the graphemic or glyph level. 
In other words, each letter, punctuation mark, and number in each page image is checked by a student worker and assigned its proper Unicode value using the Aletheia desktop tool. To date, 14 font training sets have been created, each consisting of 10 to 15 hand-corrected page images and comprise a training library that will be used to train OCR engines. I will now take you through the process of correcting page images and building a font training library uh, using Aletheia. After a student worker is assigned a page image, he or she names the image according to the first initial and last name of the publisher, the publication year, and the 20 line height. For example, an image from the 1702 Anno Regni text published by Charles Bill would be named C. Bill 1702 underscore 116. He or she would then upload the selected TIFF image um, into Aletheia. And this is what an uploaded image looks like. And across the top, you see the uh, toolbar for the Aletheia desktop tool. Uh, after the image is uploaded, um, the document is binarized, or uh, the color image is then converted to a black and white image, as you see here. Once it's converted to a black and white image, um, any noise is removed, any blotchiness, bleed throughs, dirt. These images, once binarized and cleaned, are then saved as a black and white TIFF document. The student worker will then run the Aletheia automatic segmentation uh, tool, which generates text for each character. Um, once the page is segmented, it also uh, generates a corresponding XML file, as you see here. So uh, basically, Aletheia identifies and outlines layout regions, which correspond to paragraphs, as you see here outlined in dark blue. Um, it segments the document according to lines, outlined in green, words in red, and uh, glyphs in uh, dark green. Individual glyphs in the text um, are, are outlined, and um, Aletheia then assigns a set of XY coordinates in XML for each defined region. Aletheia then attempts to read the text in the page image and assigns each letter, number, and punctuation mark a Unicode value. The end result is that the text is, is that uh, text is produced for each region, line, word, and glyph. Um, Aletheia, however, uh, often misreads the text and misidentifies the parameters of each glyph, particularly in the case of special characters such as long S's, ligatures, italics, rotunda R's, suspension marks, and printer's marks. Uh, for example, Aletheia may confuse uh, or be confused by the boundaries of a ligature. And um, it may think that uh, a ligature is actually two separate letters or glyphs, and it will define it as such. The parameters of a glyph may be corrected using the edit button um, to adjust these lines. Or uh, one can adjust the lines by deleting uh, what Aletheia um, outlined and just drawing uh, an entirely new line around the ligature using the polygon pen tool. Aletheia also has difficulty reading letters that are distorted, obscured by noise or ink bleed through, or if they are especially faint. These misreads must be corrected by typing in the correct text in the text correction box for each corresponding character, as you see here. 10 to 15 page images have been processed in this way for each font type and comprise a font training set. To date, the Aletheia team at the IDHMC has produced 14 font training sets. Each font training set contains all 26 letters, numbers, initials, special characters, as well as special font types such as black letter, roman type, and italics. Uh, once the font training libraries were in place, we started to train Tesseract by running each prepared font set through the Tesseract engine so that it would learn to read and recognize the characters of those fonts. The font sets prepared through the Aletheia procedure should have provided Tesseract with adequate training. However, initial testing revealed that this was not the case as the data output from the Aletheia a tool alone did not improve Tesseract's ability to read historic fonts. It was necessary, therefore, to develop an additional tool in order to bridge the gap between Aletheia and Tesseract. The tool uh, is called Franken Plus, um, which will be discussed in greater detail by its developer, Brian Tarbley, in the next presentation. Uh, Franken Plus has greatly improved Tesseract's ability to read and recognize early modern and 18th century fonts. 
the Alethea team at the IDHMC will continue to produce font training libraries for early modern and 18th century texts using the Alethea desktop tool. Using Alethea in conjunction with the newly developed Franken Plus tool, we hope to achieve our overall goal of making the Ebo and Echo collections more accessible to scholars in the field, as well as making our digital tools and workflow available to scholars worldwide so that they may be used in future digital preservation efforts. Howdy. My name is Brian Tarpley and I'm a PhD student in English here at Texas A&M University. Today I'll be talking about a tool I developed which we refer to in-house as Franken Plus and which allows us to build font sets appropriate for Tesseract font training. I'd like to begin by explaining one of the core assumptions we made at the outset of the early modern OCR project whose goal is to generate more accurate optical character recognition, or OCR, for historical English texts. We assumed that we could train an open source OCR engine, like Google's Tesseract, to better recognize idiosyncratic historical fonts by training those engines to recognize each character in the font. For that reason, we decided to use Aletheia, which is a tool developed by Prima Research, which allows us to open a TIFF image of a historical text, outline each glyph on the page, and then associate each glyph with a corresponding Unicode character. Once having done this with something like 15 pages worth of text for a specific font, we assumed that we would be able to take the resulting page XML output that Aletheia produces and apply an XSLT to that output in order to produce a Tesseract box file for each TIFF image which we have, for which we've identified glyphs. A Tesseract box file is simply a text file in which on each separate line of the file there is a Unicode character and then a set of coordinates for drawing a box around that character in the corresponding TIFF image. A box file, in other words, tells Tesseract where to find each character so that it can learn how to identify each of those characters when it performs OCR. Our hope was that if we fed Tesseract hundreds of instances of the letter O, for instance, in a given font, then Tesseract would become an expert at identifying each subsequent O it comes across when performing OCR so that it could produce OCR with extremely high accuracy. The problem we encountered, however, was the extreme disparity between the instances of any given letter of a historical font. Even among instances of the letter O, which one might consider to be a rather uniform character, as you can see here, there were great disparities in size, shape, and ink quality. By feeding Tesseract so many different forms of the same letter, we actually greatly confused Tesseract and the resulting OCR was disappointing, to say the least. The OCR was bad, we decided, because of three main reasons. The first and most important was because of the disparities between the different instances of each character we were feeding Tesseract. The second reason was simply due to human error. With something like 3,000 characters on any given page of text, it is very difficult to ensure that every single character is assigned the correct Unicode value. In some cases, there are multiple Unicode characters which you could assign to the same glyph. The third reason was due to Aletheia's automatic character recognition. In order to speed up the glyph identification process, Aletheia employs Tesseract to identify glyphs on the page and assign characters to each glyph. Occasionally, Aletheia will recognize certain pixel artifacts as characters. These artifacts, for instance, were all identified as underscores. It's important to note, of course, that this is not a flaw with Aletheia per se, but rather with the underlying Tesseract engine that is identifying each character. Coming to the realization that our methodology as originally conceived was flawed, we needed to find a way to address the following problems. How do we feed Tesseract only pristine instances of each letter for training purposes? How do we ensure that each glyph has been identified correctly and consistently? 
How do we eliminate the misidentification of pixel artifacts as characters? We decided, in effect, that we needed to build a bridge from Aletheia to Tesseract by developing a program to solve the aforementioned problems. Riffing off of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, we decided to call the first version of this program Frankenfile because of its ability to stitch together images of characters into a synthetic training image file that resembled a ransom note. The new and improved version of this program was christened Franken Plus. The program, like Aletheia, is Windows-based and is written in C-sharp using Microsoft's Visual Studio. It stores information about the font creation process in a MySQL database. In order to use Franken Plus, you must first create a font by giving it a name and indicating whether it is italic, bold, fixed, serif, or fracture, and then giving it an estimated line height in pixels. Once having saved your font, you must then browse for a folder containing TIFF images paired with Aletheia page XML output. When you click, when you click the ingest glyphs button, FrankenPlus uses Prima Research's image extraction tool to extract each glyph as a separate image which is dumped into an output folder. The result for any given page is a folder containing something like 3,000 individual TIFF images, one per glyph. FrankenPlus stores the file location for each image in the MySQL database and by reading the page XML file, it associates each extracted image with a Unicode character. Once FrankenPlus has successfully ingested a series of TIFF page XML file pairs for a given font, you must then click the Edit Font button. From this screen, you may browse through all the available characters associated with the font you have created. Once a character has been selected, the screen is populated with instances of that character. You may then cl click each instance of a character, which toggles whether you'd like to keep or remove that image from the pool of available instances. On this screen, for instance, you can see how all but one instance of the letter B have been removed from the pool of available images. By handpicking a given instance of each letter, we solved the first problem, which was to find a way to create a font consisting only of pristine images of each character. We also solved the second and third problems, which were to remove any inconsistently identified glyphs or pixel artifacts from the pool of available images. Additionally, FrankenPlus allows you to set an X or Y offset for that particular character. This is especially important for descending letters like the lowercase letter Y, which must hang below the baseline of the text. Notice how we've assigned the letter Y, a Y offset of 15 pixels, so that it will descend properly once we create our synthetic training images. Once you've successfully created your pristine font, FrankenPlus may then be used to generate synthetic images of text using this font. You can do this by browsing for a text file containing a transcription of a text and then clicking on the Create TIFF Box Pair button. We learned that in order to improve OCR accuracy, Tesseract prefers to be trained using text that is more or less contemporary with the kind of documents you will be OCRing with the resulting training library. As such, we use TCP hand-keyed transcripts of text that fall within the same time period as the historic text we will then be OCRing. The resulting synthetic texts look like this. As you can see, the font used to generate this image consists of relatively pristine versions of each character so as to establish a kind of platonic ideal for the Tesseract training process. Conveniently, FrankenPlus also generates a corresponding box file for each synthetic image, making them ready to be ingested by Tesseract's training process. The resulting OCR, while far from perfect, is significantly better than the original output we were able to obtain before using FrankenPlus to create a pristine font set. It must be noted, however, 
that the better OCR results shown here were obtained by using a quickly thrown together font set for the purpose of this presentation. Further testing has shown that with greater attention shown to the selection of each character and by using a dictionary and word frequency list when creating the Tesseract training library, even higher OCR accuracy rates are possible using Franken Plus. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to have shared the exciting work we've been doing here at the IDHMC. Our Franken Plus tool has allowed us to make important strides in providing greater OCR accuracy. We look forward soon to making the Franken Plus tool publicly available on GitHub. In the meantime, should you have any questions about Franken Plus, feel free to contact me, Brian Tarpley, at the email address provided above. Thank you.